evening, everyone. Let's stand and worship again. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try us. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. The battle belongs to
Jersey on a Sunday morning to worship. And if you are in the room or you are online, it is just good to be together to do what we were able to do right there. And that is sing as part of our worship this morning. So welcome, glad that you're here. If you are new with us, we would just like to say an especially warm welcome to you. Again, whether you are sitting in the room or you are watching online, uh, it is always great when people let us know that they are new. And so we're gonna ask you, if you wanna do that, just text us the word new. That's all you have to type, N-E-W, the word new to 740457. 1525. If you text us that word, we'll get a text message and then we'll text you back. And we would love to answer any questions that you have about Jersey. And again, we just want to say thank you for spending part of your day with us. Hey, a couple of updates we want to update you on, both in missions here at Jersey. So uh, a couple of big updates. Number one, a um, handful of months ago, we played a video of one of our young adults who shared with us about their call to the Middle East. And so that person, we're not going to mention their name at this point, but that person has left this weekend for the Middle East. And so that trip has begun. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's been kind of a roller coaster ride with the trip being postponed and then kind of canceled and then changed and then changed back. And so this young person has been through quite a bit just leading up to this weekend. And then this weekend, they have been jumping through hoops all weekend long. They're somewhere in Europe right now, trying to get to somewhere in the Middle East right now. And so as a church, let's make sure that we are praying really for the rest of that initial journey just to get to where they have been called to go. And then let's commit as a church to make sure that we are praying because they're not just leaving for two weeks, they're leaving for two years. And so let's make sure as a church that we are lifting this person up in prayer. When you do, even though you don't have a name, some of you might know, but if you don't have a name, that is okay. God knows who you are praying for. And so let's pray for this person and let's pray that God would begin and continue preparing the hearts of the people that this person is gonna interact with in the weeks, months, and years into the future, that God would do an incredibly special work in that area of our world uh, so desperately needed. Number two, uh, another big update. One of the um, things that happens when you give at Jersey, when you give, a portion of what you give goes to directly support missions locally and around the world, including church plants across North America. And then when we give to missions specifically, we're able to take 
portions of that fund and we're able to direct it in certain areas. Well, a portion of what we're doing right now is we're directing it to a brand new church work that's going to be starting in Queens, New York. And so some of you will remember uh, Jordan Floro was up here with Pastor John a handful of months ago. Pastor John was asking Jordan some of the different things that were going to be taking place with that uh, new church work. And so it is right around the corner. We have a video teed up, ready to go of Jordan and Melissa. Oddly enough, oddly enough, and this is, this is just pure coincidence, they're sitting right back there right now. And so, yeah, you can clap for them. So we're going to just embarrass them real quick. But I will just say this, uh, Jordan and Melissa, we love your family and we love what God is going to do through you. I know you guys have been through a little bit of a roller coaster ride as well, uh, just trying to get this whole thing started. And so as a church, we are committed to praying for you and supporting you financially. And so we are excited to see what happens next with you. But I'm going to stop talking so we can watch uh, Jordan and Melissa, who are sitting back there, actually talk to us on video. Let's watch. Hey, Jersey family. If I've not gotten a chance to meet you yet, my name is Jordan Floro, and this is my wife, Melissa. We have two kids, Annie and Judson, and we are your church planting partners in Queens, New York City. Since accepting a call to plant, the world is a much different place. Our original plan was to attend assessment with the North American Mission Board and move up to the city in June to begin a church planting residency with the Send Network in August. But as you can imagine, COVID messed up all of those plans. We were able to attend assessment in New York City and were given the endorsement from the North American Mission Board in March. But soon after, everything shut down. For the next couple of months, we were forced to sit and wait. Because Jordan had left his staff position at the church where we served, we needed other income. We reached out to friends and family to ask for prayer and God opened up a door for Jordan to have full-time employment as a delivery driver for Amazon. First Baptist Orange Park, our sending church, invited us to move into their mission house, which allowed us to save on rent and other expenses. And we've been blown away at how God's provided for us in this time. In June, we were originally, when we were originally hoping to move, uh, the city was completely shut down and we only had about $1,000 in our church planning account. And so as you can imagine, we were a little bit concerned as to whether or not we'd have enough money to move and sustain life in New York City. And over the next two months, in the middle of an economic crisis, we had churches and individuals commit to partnering with us. And on July 31st, while we were crunching numbers, we realized that at that point, we had reached our first fundraising goal of being fully supported for our first 12 months. Since that time, our partners in New York City has shared, have shared with us that the city is opening back up. And while it's not completely back to normal, uh, we can begin making plans to move up this fall. So our hope is to be on the ground in Queens uh, beginning in November. We would ask that you would continue to pray for God's provision for us. We still have financial needs and are trusting that God will provide. It is such an honor to partner with you. We look forward to seeing all that God does in us and through us as a result of your partnership. You know, I want to echo uh, what Brian had to say. What a serendipity. I had no idea you all were going to be with us. So again, welcome back. It's so good to have you. The other thing is if uh, in your heart, you, you heard God say, you always wanted to go to Queens. Why not be a part of planting a church? Well, you probably want to talk to them and see if God might be uniting you all together. So um, keep your heart open. I also want to mention if uh, God has spoken to your hearts more broadly about missions and being involved right here locally, guess what I've got for you? Uh, this coming Saturday, um, we will be tearing half of a roof off and reshingling a roof not too far away from here, about nine miles from the church. And it is a family. You might say, why half a roof? Well, they're lower income. They couldn't afford a number of years ago to put on an entire roof, so they had half a roof put on. And uh, so we're going to complete the job, Lord willing, on Saturday. So. If you'd like to join us, do me a favor, email me, let me know about your desire. It'll be a lot of fun to knock that baby out real quick. I've got to get back because I'll be preaching at 4.30, and then afterwards, I'm not going to miss the concert that we're having here. It's going to be a great experience. So 
uh, please, if you'd like to join, just let me know. Uh, the other thing I want you to be aware of, just like the Floros were sharing about a guest house, um, maybe there are some of you that don't realize that we have a guest house as well uh, for missionaries. And as a matter of fact, it's occupied right now by a family. I don't want to mention their name because they were serving in a closed country, a communist country where they were at risk. As a matter of fact, their identity was exposed by the communist country. And so they had to flee with the coronavirus and they had to leave everything they owned in that country. It's gone. All of it's gone. You can imagine some of the things that had to be left behind. And so they've been staying in our guest house for a number of months. Uh, they are excited because God has given them a new assignment. And so they're preparing to leave. But just again, a word of encouragement to you. When you hear about mission needs and opportunities, uh, we want you to be engaged, to be a part of it. We do appreciate your giving, and you have allowed us this year to do some of the greatest giving that we have ever done for international missions. And so we want to just say a word of thanks. You're appreciated, and you're making a difference, not just here locally, but globally. And we thank God for your participation. Hey, as you know, there have been a number of events that have uh, turned this year into an even more volatile experience. And so uh, the governor of the state of Ohio, Mike DeWine, sent this out this morning. And it was, on his part, a proclamation. Let me read it. Whereas October the 1st, the President and First Lady of the United States announced they had tested positive for coronavirus, and whereas Ohioans, Buckeyes, have long turned to prayer during difficult and trying times as a source of strength and comfort, and I would add healing. Now, therefore, we, Mike DeWine, John Husted, Governor and Lieutenant Governor of the State of Ohio, declare Sunday, October the 4th, 2020, as a day of prayer for the President and the First Lady of the United States and for all those who suffer from and have been affected by coronavirus. This also was a day when we were going to pray as a church for the nation of Israel. And I am exceedingly grateful for our President's courage in moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. And so this is a time for us to pray, both for our nation, our president, the First Lady, and as well for Israel. So if you'd join me in prayer. Father, this, this has been a, an exciting day. Uh, it's exciting to see the Floros with us in worship and know your plans for them and to be excited about the work that you're going to do in and through them. It was a blessing to see a missionary family in the prior service assembled together with excitement about being launched again onto the mission field. And so, Father, we have so much to be grateful for and excited about. But, Father, we also have concerns, and so we pray for the health and the well-being of our President and the First Lady. We pray for other government leaders who may be positive as well. We pray for their healing. We know that every government official is allowed to be in that position by your sovereign hand. And so we pray, Father, that you would bring healing and help into their lives and that they would see that you are a merciful God. We pray that you will help them to repent and turn from sin and to embrace the truth of your holy word. And Father, we give you thanks for the nation of Israel. We pray, God, that you would bring your peace in Jerusalem. We pray, God, that you would bless those from which you drew your son, Jesus Christ. 
We pray now in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, hopefully you have your Bibles, and if you do, I want to invite you to open them up to the book of Proverbs, the very first chapter. We're going to be focusing on verses 8 through 19, verses 8 through 19. While you are finding the book of Proverbs, I want to share with you a proverb that is directly related to the essence of this message, which is parenting and how we as parents can help direct our children down a more positive path by, of course, embracing the wisdom of God found in His Holy Word. There is a proverb, Proverbs 22, 6, that many of you are familiar with and possibly you've even claimed in your life regarding your children. I know in my life there was a season where our son moved away from Christ. It was that junior, senior year of high school, then into college. And Jan and I were pleading with God, God, please, we believe his conversion was real. It was sincere. I was there. I prayed with my son. I sensed his heart was changed. And so, God, we plead with you, bring our son back to yourself. It was a much longer period of time than what Jan and I had hoped for. There were times of of great sorrow on our part, but we would claim this promise. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I want to caution you because the book of Proverbs truly is a book of promises. Proverbs are promises. But one of the things that you must understand when you are claiming some of these promises is that God's promises always come true. They are always fulfilled. But we are not given the timing of that fulfillment. There are many times when the promises are fulfilled here in this life, but there are times when they are not fulfilled until we're on the other side. Just a word of caution. Verse 8, listen, my son, chapter 1. Listen, my son, listen, my... How how many times have you appealed to your children and said, hey, 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 I'm here, and you're trying to get the attention of your son or your daughter. People are distracted. It is hard to get their full attention. Children are distracted. There are so many devices and so many ways, so many exciting things to watch and listen to. It is not easy to connect. And so I want to encourage you. When you attempt to connect, ask God for wisdom. Because there is a time when it is unwise. In other words, when everybody is scrambling around trying to get out of the house early in the morning in the olden days when children would actually go to school, it is not a good opportunity. They're going to be leaving quickly. This is an in-depth conversation. It's about important matters. This isn't a subject that we're going to be able to discuss thoroughly enough in just a few minutes. Prayerfully ask God for the wisdom to know when to speak and how you might have your child's undivided attention. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. But notice how Solomon has the wisdom of knowing the influence and the importance of his mother's teaching being embraced by this young man. Now remember... This is a time when culturally a woman was not held in the highest esteem. Is it possible that the culture had influenced her son so that he wasn't respecting her as he should have? Dad does his job well. I mean, this is one where I think all of us just want to say, awesome job, Solomon. You're spot on, man. So what does he say? He says in verse 8, don't reject your mother's teaching. Don't disrespect your mom. She is a wise, godly woman. You need to listen to her. 
Now, someone might say, because we know that the mother of this son is Bathsheba, is it possible that because of some of the failures in her past, her son is looking down his nose and disrespecting his mother? I don't know. All I would say is dad was doing the right thing. Dad was saying to his son, don't you disrespect her. I stand united with her. You are not going to drive a wedge between us. And so there must have been a time, I can only imagine, when Solomon and Bathsheba had a conversation prior to initiating this subject with their son, where they strategized together, where they compromised together, they worked out the wrinkles. Jan and I in our parenting frequently disagreed. Frequently. I'm not going to present a picture that we were always in lockstep together the intensity of discipline, how long it should last, being too harsh, being too easy. What do we not allow? Do they go? Do they not go? We had many times different opinions, but one of the things we really did work at, and listen, this may expose your marriage being at risk. In other words, if you're saying to yourself right now, well, we never talk, well, maybe God is using this dysfunction in your parenting and in your home to help you to see you need to be working on the most important relationship. That's your relationship with your spouse. And so if you can't take the time, if you can't, talk with your wife, even though you disagree, even though you have different opinions, if you can't and aren't doing that, then it's highly improbable that you're going to have the most productive conversation with your child. Because, listen, children are smart. They want what they want. And if they see they can drive a wedge between you and your spouse, they'll do it. They'll do it. Now, this also is a time to caution because I know some of you right now are saying, I wish I had somebody to share parenting with. I wish I had someone I could bounce something off of them. But I'm parenting alone. I want to challenge you. Now, I'm I'm not saying you've got it easy, but I, I would challenge you. Is it possible that God has provided you someone else? Is it possible that a grandparent could be a resource that you could tap into? There are times when my daughter and my son-in-law could use a little help. And there are times when I've been reminded by my daughter that dad just back off. And I kind of tuck my tail between my legs and head away. But there are resources, please. I think it is immeasurably difficult to parent when you have someone to share parenting with. And when you're trying to do it solo, I can't imagine how hard that is. But I would encourage you, invite someone to stand with you and to help. Could be grandpa, you're well, okay, they live... 500 miles away. Well, what about your church? What about your youth pastor? What about your children's pastor? What about the small group leader, the Sunday school teacher of your child? Can they be an ally? Can they serve as a supportive role? So I want to encourage you. It shares with us the text that there is a garland and dependent. Notice what it says in verse 9, for they, that is, this is in reference 
to your mother's teaching, for they will be a garland of favor on your head and a pendant around your neck. In other words, if you will just listen to what your mother is teaching, you're going to look better into the future. That's exactly what is being said. Well, here's how I could see that being a reality. We're dealing with a young man. This young man wants to win the heart of a woman into the future. That young woman, if she is smart, she's watching how that young man treats his mother. How does he treat her? Does he respect her? Does he listen? And it would be a good indicator that if he treats her with disrespect, that it might be probable in the future that he would treat me the same way. Son, if you will listen and respect your mother, it will bring to you a better future. I want to encourage you to consider it. Notice the dangerous enticement that comes in verses 10 through 14. Verse 10, my son, my son. There, there, there is something, I've, I've underlined that, that phrase, my son, my son. There are times when I have navigated difficult experiences with my son. When I will say to him, son, I love you. Son, I want you to know you are my flesh and blood. I will not abandon you. I, I need your forgiveness when I've screwed up, when I've messed up royally, but, but you are my son. And, and when, when I see that, that's not benign. I mean, it, it, has, it has roots for me. And, and it, what it says is, is it says to me a commitment. This, this, is, this is the son that God has provided for me that I prayed for. And these hard times that we're going through, when we're not happy with each other, I am not going to let go of you. And there are so many times when you're going to be tempted to do that because it is just easier now to let go of it. To say, I don't want him in my life. No son of mine would ever behave that way. No son would act that way. That is a path we cannot go down. And, and notice it is direct language that Solomon uses. All I would add here is some caution about being that direct. Notice what happens. There is community. There is an appeal. What Solomon warns is this. You will be recruited by some rogue individuals in life. It's inevitable. Maybe it was already happening. Maybe he was aware of the fact that there were some guys who were influencing his son, who we would liken to a gang, the Bloods, the Crips, whatever. And what he is saying is simply this. You will long for community in your life. You'll want friends, you'll want to belong, you'll want to be liked. And son, you've got to be careful. And then he identifies this appeal that is being made. These are thugs, man. They aren't going to build you up, they're going to tear you down. He calls them sinners. All I would say is this. If your son or your daughter is moving toward maybe romantically or possibly just as a friend, some people that you know are not going to be a positive influence, be careful how you characterize them. Why? Because they may immediately shut you down. They don't want to hear anything else that you have to say. I haven't had a friend. All through junior high school, now somebody is reaching out to me. A young lady who says, no one ever asked me to the dance. Now he asked me to a dance, and you're telling me that he's a parasite? 
be careful. There may come a time when you need to be that direct. Don't go there initially. Fight the temptation. Don't pull both triggers at the same time. It will usually backfire. And notice, um, Dad says, don't be persuaded. In other words, you're going to be confronted really soon with a decision. Verse 10, where it says, don't be persuaded. What none of us want are children who have the inability to make wise decisions. I think the temptation, especially if you're like me and a pastor, my life has been about helping people solve problems. And so I'm constantly thinking about, oh, here's a course of action. Here's a path they should go down. Here's an answer. You know what gets me busted more times than anything else in my family life? Dad, stop giving us the answer. Just listen. If I had a dollar for every time I was told that, I'd be a wealthy man. Wealthy man? I'm a fix-it guy. And, and so what they, they say to me is, Dad, listen, there, there's a time when we just need you to be, be a father. Just listen. And so there's always a temptation to make the decisions for our children when what God wants us to do is to help prep them so they can be wise decision makers. I think that's what Solomon is doing. Whether you see it as crude, whether you see it effective or ineffective, as a dad, he's trying to say, son, I, listen, you're going to make decisions. I can't control you. I can't impose my will on you. And I, I would also say, frequently, I have said, okay, God, he's out of my, she's out of my control. God, I release them to you. I can't control them. I know I'm a control freak. Forgive me of that. God, I know I need to trust them into your care. Look at the corrupt community. He was spot on when he said they're sinners. If they say something like, come with us, come be a part of us, there's that recruitment, the enlistment, the cruel community they offer. Let's set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. That is repulsive to you. With a heart that has been regenerated by the work of the Spirit of God and the love of Christ in you, there is re you are repulsed by that, aren't you? I mean, you are. You're going, this is so depraved. And you should react that way, and I should react that way. But it is, again, the exposure of the depravity of humanity apart from either fear of punitive action, which is a law, or grace that has regenerated your heart and given you a new heart. And so we're repulsed. But, but notice this. It speaks of fun. It speaks of fun. When was the last time you laughed as a family? I mean, when was the last time that you as a family literally had fun? I, I sometimes, you know, I, I just get so long in the face and so serious because of all the problems that we deal with in ministry. And I have to say to myself, John, lighten up. Lighten up. You know, last night, Jan was, when you get to be our age, you, you do these word games because they tell you it helps you to have a, a brighter, more alert mind. So, you know, at night, you kind of do some of these word games to keep your brain fresh. So Jan was over there working on her iPad, doing her word games, you know, doing all of this. And I thought, this is a great opportunity because she had her hands up like this. I just, I just took this poker finger. This kind of went boom, right there, right? Not real hard, not real hard. Just right under here. Hey! You know, and she jerks back. And, of course, that only set her up for the next attack. When the finger came closer, it kind of got her right here, right under the arm. And, I mean, seriously, when is the last time you, you 
played around a little bit. I mean, when you had just a little bit of fun, when you lightened up, because somebody out there is selling to our children fun. And it's twisted. And it's perverted. And it's ungodly. I mean, what are we advancing that's fun? I want my grandchildren to run to me when I get to Allendale, Michigan. I want them to yell, Papa, Papa, Papa. But if I am the no fun guy, they want nothing to do with me. I mean, it's like, I'm like, hey, you think you can go with me to pick up something at the hardware store? When I'm planning all the time, we're going to go get ice cream together. But we can't tell mom. And so let's go. Clandestine operation. Are we having any fun? Because somebody out there is offering them fun. And, and then notice these unrealistic promises, verse 13 and 14. <laughs> this, this is a screamer. I, I think what Solomon is, is saying is, son, get ready, because they're going to promise you the world and they can't deliver. They're going to promise you so much and they just can't deliver. Be weary of people who promise you the world. They can't deliver. And then we'll find all kinds of valuable property. Oh yeah, after we've murdered them, then we'll find that valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Latest gaming. Verse 14, throw in your lot with us and we'll all share the loot. That's laughable to me. I don't know if it is to you. When I, when I, when I read that, I go, that's laughable. And here we are talking about people who are amoral, setting up an ambush for innocent people who did them no harm. And they will not only beat them, but they find joy in snuffing out their life. They care nothing about the value of human life. They're dismissive. And then they say, we promise you, we're going to divide it all up equally. Everyone gets their fair portion. Really? You're buying that? Come on, man. Go back to kindergarten. If you're buying that line, that people who are amoral, who are easy to harm others, take their very lives, are going to have your best interest at hand? Really? And, and, and notice, notice this. In verses 15 through 19, Dad says this. He says, son, listen, there are dead ends in life, dangerous roads, dangerous paths. Don't go down them. Don't go there. My son... Don't travel that road with them or set foot on their path. I think what Solomon is saying, I've been down it. I've traveled it. And it's dangerous. It's deadly. I think that is when we navigate that questionable influence where we share with our children some of our failures. There are failures that my children don't need to know about. They really don't. They just don't. But there are some failures that can serve as a warning. My children know that if it, when, when you say things about me and um, they hear about it, they'll go, oh yeah, you're the perfect pastor, you know, you're the only one in the entire earth. No, they'll tell you, I am not the perfect pastor and I'm not the perfect parent. I'm a wannabe. I am a wannabe. And so that means I have traveled down some roads, I've made horrible decisions, at times I've worked too hard.
And there are times, especially when I go back to the John Hayes before Christ, when I went to the party, when I was underaged and I would drink, and when I would drink to excess and be drunk and be sick as a dog the next day and trying to hide that from my parents, that was stupid. That was utterly stupid. And I drove my 65 Chevy Impala home while I was drunk as a 16-year-old? Do you know how stupid that is? There comes a time when you say, don't go down that road, and they look at you and they say, well, you're the pastor. You never have been tempted. Oh, yes, I have. And then notice verses 16 and following. It says, because their feet run toward evil. Notice the next phrase. And they hurry to shed innocent blood. In other words, there is rushed and impulse living. Son, listen to me. If someone is saying to you, you need to decide, you need to decide now. You need to make this decision immediately. And they press on you urgency where you disregard taking time to pray, taking time to ask people who are wiser and more mature than you. If they're pushing you in that direction, they've got an agenda. This is a warning signal. When I walk into a car showroom and I get the big time push, baby, I'm out of there. I am. I don't want to be played. And you're trying to play me. So I'm out. Rushed, impulsive, warning signal, son. They don't have your best interest at heart. If they did, they would say to you, you know, this is important. You should be thoughtful. You should have clarity of mind. You should enlist the people around you. Then look at verses 17, 18, and 19 as I conclude. What Solomon says is this. Sign up with the gang and get ready because all of the traps that you set for innocent people, you're going to get caught in. It comes around. And so what you thought was so funny and so smart and so shrewd, one day, son, you'll get caught in that same trap. Father, we pray for people who are caught in traps right now trying to live life without faith in Christ, trying to be so smart as parents that they don't need any outside help or influence. Father, I pray for the person that you have molded their heart for this moment in time to receive you as Lord and Savior. God, I, I, pray, I pray as well for our children, our youth, who many times don't comprehend how weighty the decisions that they make at this stage of life have upon their future. And the tragic influence that peers who are heartless have upon their life in the long run. Father, I pray that you'll help us as parents to have your wisdom to raise up godly children for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.